There was many people that day at the cross, and they all had different things that they were bringing, different perspectives. There was the chief priests, the religious leaders. They saw Jesus as threatening their authority. We know one leader, though, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus in the night with questions. But even he was afraid to stand up to the other leaders. And then there was the soldiers. The soldiers were just following orders, right? Those in Roman authority, especially Pontius Pilate, who saw an obscure Jewish teacher whose popularity was threatening their power. To the Romans, the cross's message to the people was more important than the actual person on the cross. The cross was a reminder of who was really in charge to instill fear and submission to Roman rule. But there was one soldier, a centurion. That person would really see who Jesus was on the cross, and he would declare, surely he was the Son of God. And then the beloved disciple, while not named in John's gospel, many think this was John. This disciple saw his closest friend in pain, helpless to stop the evil. Where were the other disciples? They had fled and hid in fear. Yes, they had heard that Jesus, heard Jesus tell them that this would happen. But now it had sunk in. Try to imagine their disappointment and grief. But this disciple, he stood with Christ at the cross and was obedient to take care of Jesus' mother. And then there was Mary. Mary, near the cross, was Mary along with other women, including Mary Magdalene. And Jesus' mother Mary remembered the promises shared by the angel before Jesus' birth. She remembered the shepherds and the magi coming after Jesus was born and all the prophecies that were fulfilled. She remembered the miracles and the teachings, but she also remembered that baby boy she held in her arms and then that little boy that would play as Joseph worked in his carpenter shop and then Jesus, a child who went to the temple and questioned the religious leaders and impressed them. Now, her beloved son was expressing his devout love for his mother, concern for her welfare, even as he was dying. And then there was the bystander. We actually don't know for sure if the person who lifted up the sour wine was a soldier or was it just someone in the crowd. But I imagine that this person, along with the rest of the crowd, was of a mixed group. Some came that, night, that day, that night, and saw just a criminal that was getting his just, re, just um, reward for what they had done, a, a common criminal dying in a shameful death. Some came to be entertained by the gruesome sight because these kinds of executions were common. There was also probably those who were disappointed in Jesus, they thought he should deliver them from the Roman rule, that he would uh, step up and become the king they believed he would be. And then there was others that grieved the loss of this one who had helped so many, whose teachings had offered them the hope of the kingdom of God. This cross represented different things to those who witnessed Jesus' death, and also for those who would hear this story over and over, retold and passed down and read in Scripture. What do you see when you look at the cross? What does this cross, is it just a symbol on a church? A necklace people wear around their neck? Of something that hangs on people's walls? What are your thoughts as you look at the cross? I hope that tonight you will leave seeing the cross as a sign of the greatest love. Let us pray. God, open our eyes to truly see the power of the cross where you demonstrated your true love through Christ laying down his life so that we might have eternal life. Amen. So tonight, I invite you to come to the cross to see and understand what happened. 
It's impossible to look at the cross and not um, remember that Easter is coming, the resurrection. We have trouble sometimes because we want to go right to Easter and ignore that suffering on the cross. But they are two linked together. You can't have one without the other. They're not in opposition to each other. They're like two sides of a coin. Just as we can't understand the cross without Easter, Easter only has its most powerful, history-altering significance because it follows the cross. I want to leave you with three important truths that the cross reveals to us. The cross reveals Jesus' purpose. Jesus had a strong sense of his calling, which included his death. After feeding the multitudes of people, it's written in Mark 8, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. In fact, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus told them, this is what's going to happen. In Matthew, as he was heading toward Jerusalem for the last time, Jesus gives more detailed account. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. There, Jesus told them the whole plan. So they knew he would not just only be killed, but he would be raised. And yet, they fled and hid that is so, so human. They heard the plan. They heard the promise of resurrection, but they didn't get it. And you know, it's hard. Sometimes when we know something's true, we know God is there for us when we're struggling. We read how God will never abandon us, and yet our emotions can take over when we are going through trials, and we can forget that that God is trustworthy and we can be, end up in despair. It's easy. Even Jesus, it was hard for Jesus, and Jesus knew the purpose. He knew his plan. He knew the purpose. He knew why this had to happen. Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. What was Jesus' purpose in going to the cross? Well, here are some things that Jesus said that revealed his purpose. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's from Luke 19. And Jesus came for those who had lost their way. And Jesus told Pilate, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus came to bear witness to God's truth. And then Jesus also said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came so they all might have real, authentic, meaningful life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 12, 46 says, I've come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus didn't come for himself. He came for all people. There is a mystery in all of this that God came into the world in Jesus and penetrated that darkness to rescue us from the dark lives we have. There's an author, Brian Zond, and in his wonderful book, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, explains it this way. He says the cross is where God in Christ absorbed the human sin and recycles it into forgiveness. At Golgotha, humanity violently sinned its sin into Jesus, and Jesus bore this sin all the way down to death and left them there. He continues, when we look at the cross, we see the lengths to which God will go to forgive sin. The cross is both ugly and beautiful. The cross is as ugly as human sin and as beautiful as divine love. But in the end, love and beauty win. This is what the cross says to us yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that life and love, not death, hold the final word. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is Jesus' purpose. The cross also reveals God's great love. When I was a child, my grandma PB had a crucifix on the wall, and I didn't know who Jesus was. My family didn't go to church. They didn't talk about Jesus. And I remember telling, asking grandma, I said, Grandma, who is this person on this little cross? And she would say, I didn't understand the whole story, but I said, she said, that's Jesus. He died because he loves you so much. I didn't understand salvation. I didn't understand the Bible, but I liked this part that Jesus loved me and he cared enough for me that he died. That's the part that stuck. And to me, the cross is always about love. People have told me sometimes that they aren't sure that God loves them. They base this thinking on whether they are worthy to be loved or good enough for God to love them. The amazing story of God in Christ is that we are all loved unconditionally, even in our most sinful, rebellious selves. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In my life, when I have struggled with whether God loves me, I'm reminded that God proved God's love at the cross. I keep going back to the cross. God wasn't a vengeful father delighting in the abuse of his son, as some people have said. We talk about God, but God is God's Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. I know it's a mystery. I don't know how it works, but I know it's true. And there, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knew this was the plan to redeem the broken and sinful wor world. And God came in the divine human Jesus in sacrificial love to free us from the power of sin and darkness in order that we might live that life of love we were created to live. When I first made a decision to be a disciple of Jesus in fifth grade, a Sunday school teacher had me read John 3:16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have er eternal life. And then he said, Now I want you to read it again and put your name in. So you can think your name as I say my name. For God so loved Dana that he gave his one and only son, that if Dana believes in him, he shall not, she shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then he said something that was really hard for me. He said, now, think of the person you most hate and don't like, the person that drives you crazy. I want you to read that verse and put their name in it. For God so loved that person that he gave his one and only son, that if this person believes in him, they shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, God's love for the cross was for everyone. The same love that forgives us for our sins forgives every person as we come to God and receive that love. This is true love. You are loved by God no matter what. And then the cross also reveals our true identity. First, our identity as sinners. yes. Um, Mark 2, 17 says, On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Romans 3, 23 reminds us we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then the cross reveals that we are forgiven. Jesus said at the Last Supper as he held up the cup, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Think about that. That's why we are forgiven in Christ. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. And it's just like the great old hymn. I love that chorus of it is well. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but in whole. Is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise God. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. That's the power of the cross. You can know your sins are forgiven and that you're right with God because of Christ on the cross. And we're healed. We are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. 
Jesus demonstrated healing in the ministry, and there's still healing. Healing happened today. There's healing of broken hearts, of broken relationships, of healing of lives torn by sin, as well as healing of our bodies. Sometimes the healing is quick, and sometimes we have to persevere, and sometimes we don't see the healing this side of heaven, but God promises in the Bible there'll be a day when there's no more death, no more mourning, no crying or pain, okay, and the old things will pass away. And then our, also our identity is that we are powerful. 1 Corinthians 1.18, where the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The Romans thought they had power, but Jesus proved on the cross what real power is, the power to overcome sin and death. That was the power, and that power lives in us through the Holy Spirit. That power helps us to love, to be faithful, to serve, and to live life like Jesus. And then we are also servants because of the cross. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus calls us to be servants as Jesus has served. And finally, disciples. This Jesus that died on the cross calls us to go and serve the same sacrificial, unconditional love and even shows us how. The risen Christ says in John 20, 21, Peace be with you as my Father has sent me. I am sending you. How do we do this? This is hard. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you see the cross, remember that when you're lost, Jesus will be your way. When you are confused, Jesus is the truth. When you're disappointed in your life, Jesus is the life you really need. Jesus is not a set of rules to follow. Jesus is a person who wants a relationship with you. Discipleship is living life with Jesus, the Savior who laid down his life on the cross for you so that you would know he really does love you. And as my grandma said, he wants to be your friend. Yes, it's hard to stand at the cross and to look at the suffering of Christ, but it is in that suffering and death that we understand Jesus' purpose as Savior of all. We understand the great love he demonstrated there, and we understand who really we really are and who we're really created to become in Christ. Yes, Easter is coming, and we'll celebrate that victory on Sunday. But tonight... Let's just receive with grateful hearts the great love of God that God has for each of us. Help us to turn from our, our ways, wicked ways, the sinful ways that, have, ways that have separated us from God and turn towards God. Help us to receive that forgiveness and the new life that he offers us all and then go and live as a disciple of Jesus every day in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, let us be honest before you now. Reveal the places that need healing or forgiveness or restoration. Let us offer to you our brokenness and sin and receive your forgiveness. Let us offer you our pain and grief and receive your comfort and hope. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen.